So we manufacture skis here in Salt Lake. But, you know, kind of cheek and jowl with that is that material science polymer chemistry piece. So while we're formulating, we can be prototyping. So we can make an entirely new polymer and actually be on the snow in about three days. Welcome to It's Material World, the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. With your hosts, Pranithi Pavia and Tom Miller. In today's episode, making skis from algae, the biomanufacturing process. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Scott Franklin, the co founder and the chief scientific officer of Checkerspot, a startup focused on synthesizing high performance polyurethane and coatings derived from the oils produced by microalgae. One of the many applications for these biopolymers are backcountry skis sold under their commercial brand, WNDR or Wonder Alpine. Thank you so much for being on the show, Scott. And we are so excited to learn more about the fascinating area of bio-derived polymers. Thanks for having me, you guys. And so we're, we've been super excited about this and we really just want to hear your company's origin story. So how did you and your team come up with the idea of building these companies, Checker Spot and Wonder Alpine? So, I mean, the idea for the company grew out of Charlie Dimler and myself, my co-founder's experience in industrial biotechnology and working at a company where we saw a lot of innovation, but it was very challenging to animate those innovations in a way that people could understand and to give us traction to actually get those things into the marketplace. And from our previous experience, we had a few examples of being able to do that. And what we saw in those examples were that animating a technology, getting a finished product into the hand of a consumer was critically important, really to building the technology and building a company. And the idea of the what, what would the technology be, really grew out of our previous experience. We had a lot of experience working in and with microalgae. We knew them to be very robust from uh, an industrial biotechnology perspective. We could scale them to very large scales. They, we could manipulate them, genetically engineer them very easily, very facilely. We could tailor their outputs, you know, get them to make things that you would never see in microalgae in nature. So a really great platform. But at the same time, we realized that if we were going to go down this path, we immediately needed to start thinking about a brand, a way to animate the technology and connect it direct to consumers and not simply be making point molecules that we would go and, you know, sell to large industrial chemical companies, because there is no connection to a consumer when you're trying to do that. And these large companies, what they want is something that they can drop in for what they use today, and it's cheaper. And those two things don't align when you're a startup industrial biotechnology company. You don't have scale, and therefore you don't have price. And so you're constantly fighting this uphill battle. What the brand allowed us to do is, again, to animate, to connect directly with consumers. The same reason why you guys are excited about talking about what we do is why that approach works. The other thing it does is it allows us to begin to understand the molecules that we're making. Again, if we were just peddling molecules to large chemical companies, there's no focusing mechanism around which to do formulation and applications development. They're going to do all that. We don't see any of that. With a brand, and particularly with Wonder Alpine, where our, our first products are backcountry skis, we have to solve specific problems with the polymers we're developing. We need to have a certain hardness. We need to have a certain tensile strength. We need to have a certain just robustness in terms of the physical properties of the material. And we're the ones that have to develop that around the monomer, the molecule, the point molecule that our platform makes. Then the other part of the question when we started was, well, what's the brand? What is the product? And actually, that took us a while. I would say it was probably about a year. We, we incorporated the company in 2016. We knew what the platform would be. And then we had been thinking about outdoor. 
we have been thinking about some product. I, I kind of call them charismatic megafauna in the product world. What's something that people are really going to care about when they go by? Making post-it notes wouldn't be it. That wouldn't get people excited. <laughs> <laughs> But if you think about like backcountry skiing and you think, think about the marketing aspects of it, the images sell the product. I mean, people look at, you know, when you look at some of the people at Wonder Alpine, Matt Sturbins, uh, Pep Fuyas in charge of, you know, marketing and brand at Wonder who are just premier skiers. And these people are, you know, in your videos and your marketing campaign that allows you to sell what you're doing, to animate what you're doing in a way that many other product embodiments never would. From a polymer perspective, a ski is a great place to go explore. If you look at the layup of a ski, there's anywhere from, you know, eight to 12 different materials in a ski, in a layup. All of those are opportunities for us that we can go explore and see if we can increase the bio-based content, improve the performance over the incumbent material, while at the same time addressing issues around sustainability and circularity. So as a first product from a marketing perspective and from, again, this idea of animating the technology, it's a really, really good place to be. So that's how we kind of arrived at that sort of segment, the outdoor segment as a really fertile ground and a way to animate the technology. That's really cool. Were you looking at other potential applications? I know that, you know, backcountry skis isn't probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of what your polymers could be used for. What else were you looking at? Well, in the early days, and even when we settled on outdoor, we were looking at things like water sport applications. You know, you could think surf, particularly paddle boards, things like that. Textiles, we know that there's still a very great need in textile finishes to move away from things like perfluorinated chemistries. Europe has moved completely away from those. Most of the companies in North America have projects, plans in place to to try and do away with those types of textile finishes. So that was definitely a big need. And so as the company evolved and we settled on outdoor recreation, we settled on skis, we really took the first material we had that we thought would be deployable in a ski, which was a high density foam. And we used it to lightweight the skis, but almost immediately we began other projects around other types of polymers and now have moved pretty heavily into textile finishes. So we expect those finishes in the coming years to, to have a place in Wonder Alpine because Wonder Alpine is an outdoor brand. So we would expect, you know, in the next few years to have textiles, garments, packs, things of that nature treated with our textile finishes as a replacement for these perfluorinated chemistries. So if you look at outdoor recreation, again, there's all manner of materials used in that space. So there's just multiple opportunities through and with this brand to continue to animate the technology. Very, very different materials. And ideally, we grow these materials, we develop these materials out of, from a practical perspective, as few of these triglyceride oils uh, as we need to. So that's part of what we're, you know, what we're trying to develop as well from an application and formulation perspective. One follow-up question is you mentioned these perfluorinated chemistries. Just briefly, could you explain what that is and what exactly the problem with that is in the current day and age? Yeah. So perfluorinated chemistries are basically, they're, you know, sometimes they're referred to as C8 or C6 chemistries. And basically what that describes is, you know, carbon molecules that are six to eight carbons long that are decorated with fluorine groups. Fluorine is a Hmm. wonderful, So think Teflon. Teflon is a a, a fluorinated molecule. And the beauty of Teflon, obviously, is that, you know, stuff doesn't stick to it. Soil doesn't stick to it. It's very oleophobic. It repels oil. It repels water. Great. The challenge and the problem with these chemistries is that they're biopersistent. They can be shed from the garment or the pan or whatever. And once they're in the environment, they not only do they biopersist, they can bioaccumulate. And they definitely can cause issues with endocrine function. Where the endocrine system relates to the systems of the human body that regulate hormone function. So needless to say, having any sort of interference with that can have serious ramifications on human health. 
And so it's just recognized, you know, generally speaking, when things start to accumulate in, in the environment, there can be a lot of concern around those. And so there's a lot of data linking these, again, to sort of endocrine dysfunction and things like that. So there's really a push to move away from them. The challenge is they are really good at what they do. And when you're trying to find a replacement, that's the challenge. The bar is, fluorine is really sort of the, the high bar in terms of those types of physical properties. And going more into the technology, for our audience, could you explain the technology that CheckerSpot is focused on industrializing? And, you know, we had mentioned this microalgae in the introduction, and now we're talking about skis and plastics. How does, how does all this stuff tie together? Yeah, complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so and it, it derives from the challenge of when you want to do this and you're a small startup, how best to do it. So... We're, you know, we're a company of fewer than 40 people, but we're, you know, our ski in terms of the raw materials that go into it, we're incredibly vertically integrated. So our technology, the way we view it, has three distinct pillars. There's the piece called the molecular foundry. That's the organism that makes the triglyceride oils. When, so we grow those in large fermenters. We feed the microalgae sugar. When we do that and we withdraw the nitrogen source, their biology is if they have sugar and no nitrogen, they convert that sugar into oil. We don't do anything to make them do that. That's what they do. What we do is we tailor their outputs. We alter the type of triglyceride they want, depending upon the, the specific polymer need or end use application for the oil that we have. So that's the molecular foundry piece. And so once we have that dried biomass, we extract that oil. You can do it mechanically, or you can do it with solvent or a combination of the two. It's the exact same way that you process vegetable oils from say soybeans or peanuts or canola. The, the processes, the, the machines, the machinery, they look the same. So now you've got an oil. The next piece of our technology is what we call the material science and polymer chemistry piece. We take that oil and we're typically doing some type of chemical modification on it so that it's now reactive to the various types of chemistries that we use. One of the principal chemistries is polyurethane chemistry. So we take this oil and we turn it into a molecule that will be reactive in those polyurethane chemistries. And the material science part of that is now taking that molecule, it's called now a polyol, and that's one of the, one of the sides of polyurethane chemistry. The other side is what's called the isocyanate side of it. When you react a polyol and an isocyanate together, you have a urethane. And so we make that polyol component. So the material science piece of that is doing a lot of applications and formulation development work. So that polyol and that isocyanate are just two molecules, but there's a lot of other monomers that you can put into those chemistries that will impact the physical properties, the performance of the final material and the physical state of the final material. So we make a polyurethane that is a foam, a hard foam. So it's sort of airy and less dense. We also make a polyurethane that is what's called a cast urethane. It looks like, oh, I don't know, you could make dishware out of it or a countertop or, you know, it looks like an epoxy, right? Same raw material inputs, but just with a few formulation tweaks, a very different physical state. So that central piece of our technology Polymer science and material science gets us to the thing, the polymer itself. Then the third part, and, and today this is entirely embodied here in Salt Lake City at Wonder Alpine, is fabrication. So, okay, we've got a polymer. What are we going to turn it into? You know, I could make uh, coupons, blocks of foam and cast urethane and go shop those around and show them to people and say, what do you think? What the fabrication piece allows us to do, and this, this again is animated through the brand, is we're turning that into an article, a backcountry ski. Um, so we've got to build skis. So we manufacture skis here in Salt Lake. But, you know, kind of cheek and jowl with that is that material science polymer chemistry piece. So while we're formulating, we can be prototyping. So we can make an entirely new polymer and actually be on the snow in about three days. Um, wow. And we could just keep iterating that process. So, 
So the folks in Wonder Alpine, you know, again, expert skiers, you know, we've got a new idea and we've incorporated a new polymer into, you know, some component of the ski or a new foam. They can be out on the snow in 72 hours looking and testing on that material. And so that's, when you go back to what I said, we're not, we're not a company that's shopping molecules around and going and asking, say, a Dow or a DuPont, you know, what do you think of this molecule? What do you think of that molecule? We would never get that kind of feedback in terms of our molecules and formulation and applications development. I can almost say never, maybe we could in a few years, but we're not going to get it in 72 hours. And so again, that, that points to this value of brand as a way to, to animate and focus the technology so that our, our learning cycle is really, really short. Talking a little bit more about a specific element of the technology, which I'm definitely curious about is you mentioned tailoring the output of these microalgae and in an earlier part of this conversation. And what do you mean by that? Right. So, you know, when you, when you, you probably don't think about vegetable oils. <laughs> <laughs> Not often, no. <laughs> so, you know, what makes olive oil, olive oil, and what makes you know, coconut oil, coconut oil, the difference in the physical properties of those oils, their behaviors and their end uses is first and probably foremost is their fatty acid composition. If we take a step back and we think about what is a vegetable oil, it's, a, it's what's called a triacylglycerol. And very simply, it is a three carbon glycerol backbone with three fatty acids attached to that glycerol backbone. So triacylglycerol. Makes sense. And the thing that differentiates oils is the nature of those fatty acid components, at least one of the things that differenti differentiates them. So the way those fatty acids can differ is how long are the carbon chains? So in vegetable oils, those will be eight carbons long to as long as 24 carbons long. A second point of differentiation is the number of double bonds or if they have double bonds. So if we have double bonds, we say that those are unsaturated fatty acids. If we have no double bonds, they're fully saturated, fully hydrogenated. Third point of differentiation is whether they have functional groups on them. So for example, castor oil, which is a, a common oil, it's used in polymer chemistry. It's stuff that you used to give, I don't know, maybe not me when I was a little kid, but probably my parents, because they thought it was good for you, but it's really not. Um, but <laughs> Oftentimes it's, you know, it's used as a laxative, for example, but it's also a polymer feedstock. <laughs> Castor oil is hydroxylated. So it's, a, it's what's called a naturally or a natural oil polyol. It is an oil that can also be used directly in polyurethane chemistry because it has this functionality of a hydroxyl group on it. And then there's a fourth way that we can tailor. So we can do all of these things. We can control chain link. We can control saturation. We can control functionality, the presence or absence of functional groups like hydroxyl groups. And then the last thing you can control actually, and, and, and this is done in higher plant oil seeds all the time, is where those fatty acids go on that glycerol backbone. So that's called regiospecificity. So the fact that there's an 18 carbon long always at the first position on a glycerol rather than at the second can impact and does impact the physical properties of the oil. Mm -hmm. So if you tailor all those things, it gives you, I won't say infinite, but a wide, wide array of triglyceride based monomers that you can do chemistry with. And one additional question to that is how exactly do you go about doing that? You know, are you modifying, didn't quite sound like this was the case, but correct me if I'm wrong. Are you modifying the genetic code of this algae or are you, you know, changing the environment for which they're in to perturb the type of triglycerides they produce? I'm just curious how that mechanism works. We use everything. <laughs> so <laughs> genetic modification those really usually fall, you know, there's two ways to do that. So one way we do that is modifying our microalgae's own endogenous genome. So by upregulating or downregulating a specific gene, uh, we can get it to elaborate a particular type of triglyceride oil, and that will take us so far. But the real, you know, the real repository of genetic information that we tap into comes from what we call higher plant oil seeds. So these are seeds in nature. 
that make triglyceride oils. And if you, if you go out in nature and you look at these seeds, you, what you find is if we look at what's called the oleochemicals industry today. Where the term oleochemical describes the study of vegetable oils as well as animal oils and fats. This field is also interested in studying fatty acids. There's about 14 or so fatty acids that are produced on those oils. And these are all the oils that come from everything from oilseed crops like peanuts and soybean and canola and coconuts to marine sources, fish oils. If you look at that whole spectrum, maybe 14 or 15 fatty acids. If you go out in nature and you look at seeds that you know are growing in the wild, they're never going to be grown as agricultural crops. They're never going to be commoditized. You can find close to five to 600 distinct fatty acid species out there in nature. So what our, you know, what our shtick is, is we're able to take these oil seeds and we do what's called a transcriptome analysis on them. So we can see in that seed, what are all the messenger RNAs? What are all the genes that were turned on in that seed? And by extension, you know, that we believe, well, gee, those mRNAs must have played a role in elaborating whatever the oil is in that seed. So we start with the seed, we determine what its fatty acid profile is and its oil content. And then at the same time, we analyze the transcriptome of that seed. And then using a bioinformatics approach, because we're pretty good at that, we can sort of <laughs> take all of those sequences and we can put them in buckets. So, you know, this bucket looks like they're genes for controlling fatty acid chain length. Those are enzymes called thioesterases. And this bucket of, of transcripts from that oil seed, they look like they're desaturases. So they're going to incorporate double bonds. And this other bucket over here, that's interesting. Those look like they might be hydroxylases. They might put on a hydroxyl functionality. In our, our platform organism, we have developed it to such an extent that it's relatively easy to take all those candidates and then put those into what we call expression cassettes, transform those into our microalgae. And because our microalgae are really, really good at making oil, we can get feedback on what those genes actually do in our microalgae. And if we get something that looks interesting, then we kind of do a deeper dive and try and develop that strain, develop that gene, maybe go back to that oil seed, look for additional, what we call partner enzymes that might enhance that function. So it's a, we have a pretty well worked out process where we can get line of sight to making something that's really novel. <music> You know, it seems as if Checker Spot's use of more renewable sources for polymer feedstocks results in improved performances due to some interesting biomaterial properties. So in this case, what benefits does using microalgae provide for the end user outside of being a more sustainable alternative for polymers? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, will, it can have a unique benefit compared to other raw materials. But to really get all the way to where now you're exceeding performance of incumbent materials, there's a lot of other formulation and applications work you're going to have to do with anything. And so that part of our technology is very, very key. And that's the advantage of having this brand and this fabrication piece as a way to iterate. Because if I just have that monomer and I'm you know, I've done a little bit of formulation in my lab and I'm trying to tell the rest of the world, no, look, this is great. My knowledge base is pretty limited. First of all, yeah. I probably haven't used it in an end use application. I just have this block of stuff and it's like really hard and it's really strong. I don't know <laughs> right. how to manufacture with it. I don't know how to use it. So those second and third pieces, I would argue are very integral to really wringing the performance out of these sustainable materials. So the raw material can help you toward that end significantly, but that's not the end of the story. You really need the other two pieces. 
Let's like dive into that more a little bit. So one of the major challenges of novel materials technologies is really that scaling from a lab, the small scale to a massive commercial scale. However, CheckerSpot is unique as a company due to the vertical integration that you mentioned in the sense that, you know, CheckerSpot produces its own feedstock polymer resins, manufactures its own products, and it works with professional skiers to gain that continuous feedback, the 72 hour cycle, like you were talking about on the product performance. So how does all of this vertical integration improve the opportunity to bring the technology of biopolymers to the commercialized scale? Well, it's basically shortening the development time of anything that you would ever be working on. So, you know, we, we had a thesis when we started the company, you know, okay, we've got a platform organism that works really well. It's really robust. We know this works at manufacturing scale. We know we can scale it. Okay. We're going to have to build a brand. We've got to have a way to animate this technology. We've got to get it into consumers' hands and get them excited. And then by extension, other people will see that, but they too will also become excited. We have this concept that we'd, we'd be able to prototype rapidly and have sort of a build test build cycle that was very, very short. We, we imagined we could do all these things. Now we're actually doing it. We're selling product. There's a lot of excitement around it. But if as far as that got, we're simply this brand, that's not going to get us to large enough scale so that we can impact these other industries. So our approach is really to build on what we've done with the brand, to move out into what we call adjacencies. So think about other people in winter sports, think about other people in ski. Can we co-develop with them as we have with Wonder Alpine, these materials in those applications. So Wonder Alpine, you know, we started last year. That was our, our product launch. We made a certain number of skis. We'll more than double that number this year. We'll probably in the neighborhood of about triple that number next year. That's still a relatively small market. But when you talk to some of the large incumbents in the ski industry, you know, some of those folks are going to make 20, 30 times as more than that, actually, <laughs> you know, 50 times as many skis in a year as we might make next year. They're very large. So that's an opportunity for us to widen this circle and increase scale. But in the grand scheme of things, that's still tiny. That's still vanishingly small. So what we have to build through this expertise, through these three pillars, is to not only get to those adjacencies, and we don't have to get to these further out applications immediately, but think about applications like automotive. Think about applications like building materials. Those types of applications will drive scale. And sure. the technology that we're applying is exactly the same. So when you think about the core competencies that we're developing as a company to meet the needs in the outdoor space and within a ski, they're no different than the core competencies that you need to develop to say, develop that lightweight bumper on a Tesla or a Rivian or some other electric automobile. It's the same applications work. As we build that notoriety, as we prove ourselves in this outdoor space, at the same time, we're working to sort of capture the imagination of developers at these other companies, because only with that wider adoption will we achieve that scale that will get us to price. That's going to be one of the ultimate challenges for industrial biotechnology. If you don't get to that scale, you'll just be very niche. And by extension, your impact will be less. It's just that simple. So just to clarify then, you know, your company is clearly growing very rapidly. And so that kind of brings that balance between new processing challenges, but also the economies of scale that you're mentioning. Do you foresee that development time that you're talking about increasing or decreasing as your company and your brand continues to grow? Well, right now it's pretty rapid. You know, I mean, think one of the, one of the mistakes that companies could make, and my experience is just in industrial biotechnology. So I'll go with that as an experience. <laughs> is that if you want to do more stuff, you throw more bodies at it. That'll get us there faster. Nine times out of 10, that's not, that's not the way to go. You need to be very methodical and thoughtful. You kind of want to operate at this relatively high frequency. 
sense of urgency, but oftentimes, you know, you don't know what you need. You, you need to wait. You need to be patient. You need to see how are things developing. You know, I don't know that I need five more people today. A lot of people might look at what we're doing and say, no, you need five more people. And I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> you know, we don't know what direction we're going in right now. We're getting plenty of feedback. So part of it is just, you know, you have to be patient enough to, to let these things kind of develop. We had a very, what I believe is a sound thesis of how to build this technology. Focus the technology through the brand. The feedback will inform you. Don't overextend right. yourself. Don't try and overreach into 50 applications at once. I guarantee you, you will fail. Hmm. Build out the credibility through the brand. And so we're really taking this measured approach to building this capability. So we build a better, a deeper understanding and we'll be far more prepared to partner with people that want to go into sort of that next ring of applications outside of what we're, we're working on today. That's a great way to think about it. And so, you know, talking about this paradigm of biomanufacturing. So, you know, how does this paradigm of biomanufacturing help overcome these issues of scalability in this new technology space. I mean, because you made the point quite clearly that you need the economies of scale thing to work out to get the price where it needs to be, to really broaden your impact on the space. And what exactly does biomanufacturing mean to Checker Spot? Well, I mean, biomanufacturing is that process whereby, you know, we're typically starting with a fermentation-based technology, some micro, that is, you know, making a certain type of molecule. And it's, it's critical that if, again, if these molecules are going to have a real impact, you're going to have to do this at very, very large scale. I mean, in essence, what we're doing is, is we're converting the photosynthate that either a corn plant or a sugar cane plant or a sugar beet takes sunlight and converts it into sugar. We're taking that sugar and we're bioconverting it. We're biotransforming it into something else, into some other molecule. And we do that through an organism. You know, the organism is just a shovel. It's just a vehicle. You know, we're, we're moving energy through it in the form of sugar and we turn it into something else. So what biomanufacturing has to do, what it has to be able to do is do this at scale, at scales that are relevant if these renewable chemistries are going to take hold and they're, they're actually going to be utilizable. And the scale you're competing with is the petroleum industry. So, you know, the United States, 20 million barrels of oil a year is what we use for transportation, fuel, and, you know, chemicals, oleochemicals, everything else that we, we turn those into. I mean, that's a huge amount of material, a huge volume of material. So thinking about how do you scale these processes and how do you think like an oil refinery? Oil refineries are remarkably efficient. Wicked smart people have designed oil refineries. I mean, they are really good at rigging every penny out of what goes into that plant. And I think, you know, when we think about biomanufacturing, we need to think the same way. Every input that goes into that fermenter needs to result in a product somewhere else. For us, it's a triglyceride oil, but we also need to think about, you know, the cellular material that's left, which is about, you know, 15% of the weight of the cell is, you know, we don't currently utilize in our polymer. So what do you do with that material? And then more importantly, with that oil, how many different things can you turn that into? Because that's that's all a barrel of oil is. When people first started using crude oil, you know, what did they do with it? They burned it. You know, not very interesting and not very exciting, but, you know, they were trying to replace whale oil. So <laughs> that was kind of an end use. But think about, think about the transformation of a barrel of crude oil over, you know, say, the 150 years that it's been processing. I mean, almost everything you're looking at and holding in your hand came from that black stuff, which is pretty remarkable. So from a biomanufacturing perspective, we really need to think the same way. We need to think about whatever we're making, we've got to ring as many, as many different monomers, if, if you will, out of that material as we possibly can, because that will allow us also to achieve scale right. and price and cost. We've talked a lot about how this technology is so uniquely equipped to meet scale, but let's talk a little bit about challenges here. So what are some of those challenges currently facing the mass market utilization 
of this microalgae biopolymer production technology, either within Checkerspot or in this space, broadly speaking. Within Checkerspot, it's the challenge of being a very vertically integrated company, trying to keep that very small, very measured growth, very thoughtful growth, trying to do a lot of things simultaneously. That's always a challenge, you know, that's the way it's going to be. To me, it's not a challenge, that's kind of fun. The adoption part, uh, again, I'm pretty comfortable with. The sort of the reception, the positive reception to the skis, positive reception from the end use consumers, the positivity that that has generated outside of the winter sports realm to me is we're seeing that what we said we would do, we're doing, and we're seeing the, the positive effects of that. So I'm, I'm very positive that the approach will work. We just have to kind of keep our heads down and uh, just keep executing. And so we touched on this a little bit earlier, but basically on our social media, we sometimes post about how material science plays a role in settings you don't often think about or expect them to play a role. And we actually discussed how polyurethane hard foams are used in surfboards. And you, you mentioned this before, but that kind of leads me to the question, are you planning on branching out to other applications? You mentioned textiles, but you know, what applications are these high performance materials best suited for? Well, again, I think, you know, I made the comment earlier, if you look around the room, you see materials that are derived from petroleum everywhere. You know, your laptop or your computer has components on it that utilize high performance materials. So it's really a matter of sort of leaving it open to your imagination. Again, I really liked the fact that when we settled on outdoor sports, you know, we let that idea percolate for a little while and we settled on a ski. And, and I love the ski because it's a multi-material product. And there's just a lot of places you can play with trying to get your material in there to try and alter, change, improve the performance of the finished good. So I think, I mean, again, I, I think the space is it's limitless in terms yeah. of what you could do. The challenge is remaining focused. So you're talking a lot about in this super long-term sense, outdoing the incumbent oil companies. And so is there a future where all of our plastics could be derived from non-petroleum sources using technologies such as those developed at Checker Spot? You know, all, all is a big number. <laughs> you know, <yeah. laughs> There's probably something, you know, I'm probably going to get the numbers wrong, but I'm, I'm probably not far off, you know, several billion pounds of polyurethane produced every year. That's a whopping big number, right? <laughs> I think that there's going to be probably some mix. I think part of it is going to be brands that are moving away and moving toward more sustainable chemistry. There will come a tipping point where we start to achieve that cost parity. You know, look at wind and solar. I mean, 10 years ago, solar power, wind power, we're never going to get there. You know, come on, yeah, coal is cheap and everything else. Well, today, now, those power sources are so cheap, we can start to think about doing things that from an energetics perspective, five or 10 years ago, we would have completely ruled out. Now we're starting to think about, you know, and I, I'm thinking about things like carbon sequestration that people are looking at because, well, the price of photovoltaics of energy conversion of wind power has gotten so low, we can actually think about these things. And I think renewable chemistries are going to be no different. I think they're going to have the same trajectory. And I think that there's going to be a tremendous pull from a lot of brands that are going to start demanding that. And they'll start to lay down some bets and they'll start to pay a bit of a premium and that will act to prime the pump. And then I wouldn't be surprised to see, as with wind and solar, a lot of energy companies start to play in that space as well. And they're going to be really good at it. Now, if you know how to build an oil refinery, you can figure out how to build a vegetable oil plant and make that thing run like an oil refinery. So I was actually wondering just from a systems level perspective, what would the effects of this type of future, even if not all of the plastics can be derived from non-petroleum sources, what would the effect of this future have on the environment and fighting back climate change just in general? 
Well, you know, I mean, if you look at our raw material feedstock and you look at where it's produced in a field in Brazil grown on sugarcane, that's an incredibly closed system, much more so than, say, growing corn in North America. In a cane mill in Brazil, you've got a fermentation facility that's co-located with the sugarcane mill that makes sugar. And that sugar goes to feed the fermentation system. You might also make ethanol with it. When those two plants are co-located with one another, all the power generation from those two plants goes from cogeneration that comes from burning what's called the sugar cane, the gas, the stocks. After you extract all the sugar, you use that to generate power. So that power runs the two facilities, the fermentation facility and the sugar cane mill. The excess power goes back into the grid. So you put more power into the grid. But Beyond that, the, the nutrient cycling between those two plants and the sugar cane field is a very closed loop. The fermentation water feeds back to the sugar cane mill. The steam feeds back to the sugar cane mill. If you're doing ethanol production in the sugar cane mill, the, what's called the venas, the supernate that's left over after ethanol fermentation, that goes back into the cane fields to fertilize the cane crop. Super, super efficient process. You don't get that from an oil refinery that pulls a barrel of oil out of the ground. So, you know, you've established this loop. When we get to our, you know, polymer chemistry and our fabrication piece in, here in Salt Lake. So Checker Spot is a B Corp. According to bcorporation.net, certified B Corporations are, quote, businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose, end quote. And one of the things we're very focused on is, is sustainability. Well, when you build a pair of skis, you know, if you just look at the mass balance, what's the mass of the raw materials I put in? And, you know, what do I get out in mass of skis? It's about, uh, you know, one to one. You have about one part ski and one part waste. So we have a pretty significant development program within that fabrication piece and the polymer science piece to really significantly reduce that waste output. So it goes beyond you know, the molecular foundry and the sustainability of producing the algal oil. It also hits home on the material science polymer chemistry piece and then the fabrication piece. So how much can we reduce those outputs, that waste in ski manufacture? We've really been making skis for two years, but We've already reduced that significantly in this year's manufacturing by incorporating a different type of material derived from our algal oil that significantly uh, reduces plastic waste, for example. And we have some other parts that we'll introduce into the ski that will significantly reduce raw material usage that go into the ski. So it's taken a really, really holistic approach to how we're doing each and every component. And again, being a certified B Corp provides a focusing mechanism for us to look at all of those. The third example I'll give is, is on the chemistry side. Our chemistry conversions this year, we've eliminated a significant solvent input into one of the chemical conversions that we do on the triglyceride oil. That has a huge impact because all that solvent input went, previously went to waste, and now we won't use the solvent and we won't generate the waste. So at each and every step, if we can just spend the time to look at these things, I think holistically this whole approach can have you know, positive impacts at each and every part of our technology. You know, aside from the, the climate issue, broadly speaking, and, and looking to solve that problem, in terms of the plastic waste problem then in particular, how are biopolymers produced via this method more readily biodegradable or recyclable that would have a benefit in tackling the plastic problem that we face? Or is that perhaps not a benefit in this space? It can be. So we've got, a, we've got an internal initiative whereby we're taking back skis that you know, people buy from us. And part of those initiatives that I was talking about around reducing waste, part of that is looking at the reincorporation of the ski waste streams into the finished product hmm. to reduce raw material inputs. So part of that ski buyback program or take back program in the early days is to really provide the raw materials for a lot of that development work. So ultimately, you know, in a perfect world, we would get to this closed loop. You know, we're always going to use virgin materials. 
And what we want to get to is a point where that waste is absolutely de minimis, where those raw materials are absolutely the minimum. As far as biodegradability, I think you need to be careful when you talk about that. Some people will claim that polyurethanes are biodegradable. You know, certain types are. The types that we generally make, I don't call them biodegradable because of the time function associated with that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to throw these in your compost pile and come back in three weeks and they're gone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> talk about several years. Are they going to degrade to a certain extent? I'd say moderately, but I wouldn't be prepared to call them biodegradable. I just, sure. I just wouldn't. Say that. So the question is for us, from a development perspective, can we get to monomers that will give us that capability? And that's mm -hmm. certainly something that we're absolutely thinking about. That's really cool, especially from the just recyclability and, you know, raw materials to that output and trying to minimize that input there. So from the polymer industry perspective, shifting away from sustainability, what impact do you foresee this technology having on the rest of the polymer industry? Do you think that some of the methods that you're using could be applicable for processing of other types of polymers? Oh, I think so. And the, you know, look, the polymer industry, again, you know, super smart guys, they're in a business, right? And they're going to be very sensitive to price, which in our case is going to be driven by scale. And so again, to make inroads with those folks, you know, you can't have something that's, you know, $500 a gram, you know, they're going to deal with things that are, you know, maybe their high end stuff is, you know, 10 or $20 a kilo or something that's very high end, maybe niche for them, but you know, their commodity based materials might be a dollar a pound, a lot of them. Right. And so you just need to find where's the sweet spot at this point that you could get in to those types of materials. You know, historically, there's good precedent for triglyceride oils being commodities. They are today. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, look at palm kernel oil or palm oil, you know, $700 a metric ton, 70 cents a kilogram. Very cheap, very inexpensive. <laughs> uh, why, is, why is that? Scale. Are there negative consequences to that, environmental consequences in the case of palm? Sure. Yeah, there are. So there's trade-offs, you know. This organism in this platform has that kind of capability to reach yeah. those kinds of scales and those kinds of productivities. So that part doesn't, that doesn't concern me at all. And the fact that we're able to tailor this organism to make this, you know, these wide degree of outputs Again, I, I, I liken it back to a barrel of oil. You've got this one thing from which you can derive these many, many, many different types of monomers. You know, we've covered a lot today in this conversation about producing these polymers using the oils from microalgae. And you seem very confident in the direction that Checker Spot is headed, which we absolutely love. So I just like you to bottom line it for us and you know, what would you like for our listeners to take away from this conversation about the potential impact of the technology that CheckerSpot is using? I would just say that, you know, CheckerSpot, if you, if you think about us, we're, you know, we're a very relatively small today, highly vert vertically integrated company that is really taking a look at kind of cradle to grave, everything that we're doing in the manufacturing process, which I also think is fairly unusual for a company of our age and maturity. We're still pretty young. We're trying to build a lot of these processes in early, but I think there's absolutely a lot of promise in what we're building. And one thing that I haven't said that I should point out is we've got really interesting technology. There are parts of it that we've built here during the course of, of Checker Spots development, but as it relates to you know industrial biotechnology generally, you know there's been a lot of failures out there. There's been some success. We owe a lot of our success to a lot of failures in the past and a lot of success in the past. You know, you don't know what works until you go out there and actually try it and you crash and burn and then you go try something else. And we kind of take that on as a philosophy internally. We, we learn by doing and we try things. And our ability, I think, to find a place where we think we could be successful is done on the shoulders of a lot of people before us who tried things that didn't work and some things that did work. 
So I think, you know, the, it, I think everything works this way from sort of an invention perspective. You're always building on the success and failure that other people achieved before you. And don't underestimate the failures. Those yeah. are really important to getting you where you want to where you want to go. Hopefully don't repeat them. <laughs> but you also know what doesn't work. So all those things collectively are, are really, really important. So for our listeners who want to reach out to you, is there, you know, a better, is there a good way of connecting with you, whether that's LinkedIn or the website or email? Uh, I would just go to our Checkerspot website and okay. direct any questions or anything, you know, to me, and it'll find its way. And I, I'm pretty good about answering those things. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll definitely drop that link in the show notes below. Well, thank you again so much for your time, Scott. We really appreciated, uh, you know, learning more about this technology and its promising future in in making polymers just a little bit more interesting. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and Checker Spot appreciates the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material Worlds podcast. We look forward to releasing our next episode in two weeks. Please subscribe to our podcast feed in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. And tell your friends about our show on social media. But until then, if you want to hear from us, we are on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Follow or subscribe to us on those platforms to keep up to date with all things It's Material Worlds between our episodes. Links to our social media sites will also be in the show notes. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear it. We are just getting started with the podcast and want to grow this show with our community's input. You can send us feedback through messaging on any of our social media sites. We'd also love to hear your comments through reviews on Apple Podcasts. But until then, take care and stay healthy.